Hi, I'm Paul Stoffrigan. I'm the creator of Teensy. And since creating Teensy 3, I've had this dream of creating an awesome audio library. So my name is Alicia Dynamic, and I am an educator and artist and maker. And before we get started on the tutorial, we want to show you a preview of one of the many awesome things you're going to learn to do with Here this library. So right now we are playing two songs simultaneously from this SD card and we're able to pan between them using a software mixer. So since starting this audio system, there's been consistent feedback that there's been a strong need for more tutorial material that we haven't uh, documented and explained very well how to get started with it. Uh, a couple months ago, the uh, Hackaday folks asked me if I would put on a workshop. So this seemed like a perfect opportunity to create this material and uh, show how to use it. So Paul asked me to help him teach this workshop. And since it's been announced, there's been a lot of feedback from people who aren't able to attend the conference that they would like access to the material as well. So we decided to film this tutorial so that we can show you guys all the steps. Before we get started, I should mention the workshop manual, which has more detail than we can fit in this YouTube video. The PDF will be available on the hackaday.io project page. An HTML version, which will update over time, will be available from the Teensy Audio Library page. Especially if you're going to do these tutorials on your own, use these links to get more info. At the Hackaday convention, we pre-built these breadboards to save time, but if you're doing this at home, you'll need to have a Teensy 3.2, this audio shield, the microphone, and an SD card preloaded with four music files. You'll need three buttons connected to digital pin 0, 1, and 2, and you'll need two pots connected to analog pin A2 and A3. The software required is Teensy Duino 1.26, which you can check with the Help About menu. All of the example files used in this uh, tutorial and the workshop are in the Examples menu, Audio, Tutorial, and here they are, all of the files. So the first sketch that we're going to load is hardware test. This will verify that your board is set up correctly and all your components are working. Once it uploads, you should hear a beeping sound. So there it is. You want to open up your serial, serial monitor next. And as you press the buttons, you should see a readout on your serial monitor. So digital zero, digital one, digital two, and analog A2 and analog A3. Once you've verified that everything's working correctly, now we can go and play some music. So now we're going to move on to the playing music sketch. Now this is just the equivalent of a Hello World program. So you go ahead and get that loaded and you should start hearing music through your headphones. Now, of course, if all we wanted to do was listen to music, we would just use an MP3 player. So the whole point of using microcontrollers, being able to do other things while the music is playing. So now let's upload our blink while playing sketch and you should see that the uh, LED will be blinking while the music is playing. One of the great features of this library is that you can use delays in your sketch without causing a break in the music. Throughout these tutorials, there's blocks of code that can be uncommented to change the function of the sketch and other things to try. In this example, we're going to uncomment this block, which will allow us to use the knob connected to A2 to control the volume level. So once it uploads, you should start hearing the music again. And you can also see that our LED is still blinking. As we move the pot, Now you can hear that volume change. You might also notice that it's really jumping around. And that's because of our delay for the LED function. Um, 
it's only reading this knob every half second, so you're gonna get that delay. You're gonna get those jumps even though we're turning the knob really smoothly. So in the next section, we're gonna show you how to fix that problem. Let's take a moment to show how we're making this video. We're using two of these little voice recording units. We're speaking into one, and we're recording the output of the Teensy with this cord on the other. The Teensy audio library is CD quality sound. It's all 16-bit, 44 kilohertz. But after two of these recorders are mixed in video editing software and then re-encoded by YouTube, the sound you hear in this video won't be the full quality of the Teensy. So in this section, we're going to look at a better way to blank the LED. Now the LED should be blinking because of this code here. Instead of waiting with a delay, this code uses an elapsed millis variable to decide whether or not to turn the LED on or off, but it never waits. With the LED blinking, we can do other things inside the loop and have rapid response. For example, here we read the knob, and now when Alicia turns the knob, we should hear the volume respond instantly because we're not delaying. This code also uses the bounce library, which we'll be using in all the rest of these tutorials to read the push buttons. The bounce library is a very reliable way to read buttons. And here, of course, we have some code that will read, that will allow the push buttons to control jumping to all four of the files on the card. That wraps up simply playing with these examples, and in the next section, we'll look at how to create your own audio systems that are not part of these examples. You'll actually create and draw them with the design tool. So the previous examples had audio systems that were already composed. Now we're going to use the design tool, which you access with this URL and a web browser. This design tool lets us create our own audio system. In this case, we're going to use the I2S output to send data. So we'll drag this onto the canvas. I2S is the communication protocol between the Teensy and the audio board that uh, sends digital audio data. We'll scroll down to the play section and find the SD card wave player. Now that we have these both on the canvas, and we'll draw connections between them. And each of these connections will cause a stream of digital audio data at 44 kilohertz, 16 bits, to flow between these devices. So two data streams will flow from the SD card to the digital output. We need one more object near the end of the list, which has no connections, but it allows us to control the audio board. So this one here provides control functions that we'll use to enable the audio so once we've composed our system, I click the export button and it will create the code for Arduino. And then we just copy this code. And from here on out in all of these tutorials, we paste the audio system code into Arduino and then upload. And when this finishes uploading, we should hear it play the music that we heard in the first part. So now we've recreated the system from the first part, but we created the audio system ourselves using the design tool instead of having it given to us in the example. And from here on out, we'll create more sophisticated examples in the next part. In this example, we're going to be looking at mixers. Mixers are important because they allow us to combine more than one sound and to control how much of each sound is in the output. So we're dragging two wave files and two mixers. Uh, two mixers because our sounds are in stereo, so one will be mixing the right channel and one will be mixing the left channel. So we're splitting these sounds into left and right, and then into our output. As you can see, when I click on these objects, it changes the right side. That's our documentation panel, and it explains what the object is and how it works. So now that we have our objects arranged, we can export the code. 
copy and paste into our window. Now we can upload that. Now we know it's working because we can hear both of these songs playing at the same time, but it sounds pretty terrible. So we're gonna go ahead and turn it off. Let's scroll down to our mixer code and you'll see that the gain is 0.5 here. And there's a really good reason for that. Our signals can only be between negative one and positive one. They can't go above 1.0. And because we're mixing two together, we need to multiply them by 0.5 so that the total of the two mixed together is less than 1.0. If we try to go over one, then it will cause clipping and that will create harmonic distortion. So if you want to see what that's like, go ahead and play around with those values. The higher you go, the worse it's going to sound. So let's keep scrolling and find this block of code that's commented out. We're going to uncomment it, and this is going to allow us to use the A3 knob to pan between the two songs. So now that the code is uploaded, you can hear that we are switching between both songs. This uses two equations that you can see at the top. The first one assigns a value to gain one. That number is always between zero and one. The second equation subtracts that from 1.0. And that's how these shift as you turn that knob. Those two numbers go up and down, but they never add up to more than 1.0. And that keeps us from having any problems with clipping. This also shows the way that this library allows us to control the audio system with an Arduino code while it's running. For very short sounds, we can play a file, we can play data directly from Teensy's memory using this memory player object. In this example, we'll try four of these. These memory player objects uh, have a lot of advantage in that they are very efficient. They don't use uh, hardly any of the processing power on the Teensy, and they don't require an SD card if we can fit the entire sample into the memory uh, on the Teensy. So we can make a smaller, lower cost project. If we put the mixer on here, we'll just combine these so we can play four separate samples all simultaneously. Now in this portion, we have one signal and uh, in this design tool, we can connect one output to two inputs. Uh, this type of connection where there are two things, where one thing feeds into two is legal. However, you cannot connect two signals to the same input. Each input can only have one signal connected, but each output can connect to many possible inputs. So when we upload this code, copy from the design tool, paste it into Arduino. And this Arduino sketch that we'll upload has these samples already placed inside of it. And this is what the sample data looks like. This is the actual data that we'll be playing uh, into the output when Alicia hits these buttons over here. So these samples are very, very useful for short sounds like drums, little sound effects, and uh, as we'll see a uh, few moments later, uh, a little bit longer sounds as well. Near the end of this example, you can see this comment.code, which will allow us to play three other sounds when, uh, when the A3 knob is turned all the way up. These other three sounds are a kick drum, a gong, and a cash register. You can see the uploading takes a little longer because we have these large samples as part of our code. Now let's see if we can hear them. There they are. As Alicia plays those. You can see something a little unusual here with the gains. You can see that these four gains are set to 0.4. Uh, these could potentially add up to 1.6, and we would get clipping beyond 1.0. And that really illustrates that uh, the setting of gain in, uh, in these types of audio applications is very subjective. 
that uh, you know we talked about a hard rule earlier of not going over 1.0 but in this case and in many cases you can break these rules or bend them with pretty good results in fact let's try doing something very extreme because these sounds are so short and because the probability of a clipping incident where the short sounds collide just right is very very low we can turn the sounds up and get a lot more dramatic impact and we'll see if Alicia is able to get all four of them to play at the same time and see if we can hear any distortion. So there we have sample playing and uh, bending and breaking our rules about mixer gains. So next we're going to test to make sure our microphone is working. So we're just going to add another I2S object, but an input this time to our canvas and connect the two objects together. You might be wondering why they're called I2S objects. It's just because that is a standard audio, digital audio communication format that um, the Teensy uses to communicate with the audio shield. So now we're uploading our code. Test. 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 And so, so we, we can, can hear that the, the microphone's picking up. Test. So let's try increasing the gain on that. We're going to raise the gain up to 60. And see how that affects our audio. Test. 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 So I guess you could say that it's working. So now that we've been successful collecting live audio with our microphone, we're going to try putting together a delay. Now this is going to look more complex than it needs to be because the 8 tap delay line that we're using would be capable of transmitting back 8 different copies on different delays of the same sound. Though in this example we're only going, we're going to mix them all up and hear them as one. One thing to pay attention to when you're putting this together is that your I2S input, the microphone, that you're splitting off one channel between the mixer 3 and the delay. Then you're going to be splitting that third mixer back out into two channels for the I2S output. So now we're going to export this code and copy it into our Arduino window. Now when this uploads, it should start playing my voice back as a delay. Test, 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 test. Okay, so, okay, you, can so you can hear the way, the way that, that is delaying, is delaying my, voice. my voice. It's actually, it's actually making, it making it quite difficult, quite difficult to, concentrate to concentrate as I listen, as I listen to, it. to it. So I've turned off the delay so that you can hear me because I want to bring you down to a line in the code that we have been ignoring till now, that's the audio memory. You can see here that right now we're allocating 160 buffers. Each buffer uh, uses 260 bytes of Teensy's memory, so this is pretty significant. In previous sketches we've just been allocating about 10 or so, um, but the delay uses a lot of memory due to the fact that it's storing that sound until it plays it back. So you can see if you come down here, global variables, we're using 49,656 bytes of memory. So it's a really cool effect, but it doesn't come for free. Um, and you can disregard this uh, error message if you get it as well. It's a bug in this version of Arduino, the 166, and uh, it doesn't actually apply. So in most audio systems, we connect the signals in a forward direction like this we connect into a mixer but it's possible to use a delay object and connect in a backwards feedback path so we can take a delay and we can connect our signal into the delay and then we can connect the output of the delay and feed it back and allow the sound to travel in a loop 
and we'll hear what this does in just a moment. This creates a repeating echo. So when we export this code to Arduino, come and paste it over here. So the sound creates a repeating echo that will flow around this loop. So if we look at the code, this line here sets the gain on the mixer, channel 3. Uh, if we look back at the diagram, as the sound flows into the delay and then flows along this path, this gain on this channel of the mixer determines how much of the sound will make it around this loop each time we hear the echo. Uh, this code has uncommented section where we can make the knob adjust that gain and we can adjust how much echo we get each time we hear this. So when we try this now, we should be hearing the echo again. Hello. If, hello. So if Alicia turns the knob all the hello, way up, hello, 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 hello. we should hear the echo repeat Nearly forever. Hello, 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 hello. It should keep repeating hello, on and on and on, hello, and as we talk hello, more, hello, hello, more will end up in the loop. Hello, 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 now, if she turns the knob down, we'll hear the echo die out quickly because less of it is feeding around the loop. So, one of the dangers uh, with using feedback is it's possible to get too much gain. And the end of this program is some code that will let us easily experiment with this. When we upload this, the, uh, the button, the left button, will increase the amount of gain feeding back into that mixer and allow us to have more than 1.0 around the loop. So the sound will grow larger and larger each time it goes around. So Alicia, if you turn up the knob and we get an echo going, hello, we're hearing an echo. Now, if you push the button, we should hear a terrible sound. And so we're hearing the effect of too much gain around the loop causes the sound to become larger and larger each time it flows around in that feedback path. So when you use feedback in your projects, you need to be careful to always have the gain less than 1.0 so that sound doesn't get trapped and grow larger and larger each time it goes around the loop. In this next example, we're going to try using filters. So first we're going to add the play SC wave back to our canvas because we're going to be playing music from the SD card again. We're adding two filters, one for each channel of our stereo audio. Now we're going to add two mixers, and this is a different use of mixers than we've seen so far. Mixers can also be used as a switch or a router. So here we're going to use them as a three-way switch routing our three different filters back into our headphones. So the three filters that we're working with here are low pass, band pass, and high pass. So that's what these three channels represent. So just going to route all that back to our I2S1 output export our code and paste it into the Arduino window. So when this uploads, we should start hearing the music again. So we'll start with the low pass filter. And as I turn the knob, you can hear less filtering and then more filtering that says the frequency of the filtering increases and more of the high notes are filtered out. So let's listen to the mid pass. And the high pass. Now these filters don't necessarily sound great, but there are a lot of applications for them in sound projects. One that crossed our minds that relates back to the previous example is if you were trying to imitate an, a natural echo, 
um, you might want to include a filter so that the sound degrades in a more natural way as it passes back and forth through the loop. So in this part, we're going to look at oscillators. The library, the Teensy Audio Library has many of these oscillators in the synthesis section. This general purpose waveform oscillator can create all types of, can create several types of waveforms. This is a frequency modulated oscillator. This is a standard sine wave. And we have noise sources. We also have what's called an envelope, which we'll get to in a moment. We use a mixer to we use mixers like we used in the last example to allow us to select which of these things we want to listen to. So in this example we can hear one of these four types of oscillators running and we can hear it either directly or we can hear it run through this envelope object which we'll talk about in a moment. And then we're going to feed this to the headphones. So when we export this system and uh, copy it into the example code and upload it to the Teensy, we should be hearing the uh, default, which will be the sawtooth oscillator. So we should be hearing, we should be hearing sound as Alicia turns this up and down. So this is what a sawtooth waveform sounds like. Now when uh, pressing the left button, we'll cycle through each of the types of waveforms. So now this is what a pure sine wave sounds like. And then let's try each waveform. So now we can hear a square wave sounds different than a sine wave. Each waveform has a distinctive sound. You can hear the triangle wave. And finally, let's go back to the sawtooth waveform that we started with. Now, these waveforms in this example can, f can flow into the, uh, the modulated sine wave. So when, uh, when Alicia presses the middle button, now we'll be hearing the, the sine wave and it will be controlled. Now let's turn the control waveform all the way down to the lowest frequency. An important point of these frequency generators or these oscillators is that they all are capable of being low frequency oscillators that are used to create control signals that control other oscillators. So in this case, where it's going very, very slowly, we should hear the sine wave increasing in frequency and then suddenly go back down because the sawtooth is rising up and then suddenly dropping. So now let's change to each of the types of, uh, of control waveforms. And now we should hear the sine wave increase and decrease gradually in a sinusoidal fashion. So the frequency is being changed by the slow waveform. Let's try the square. And we can hear that each of these control waveforms is changing the tone of the sine wave. There's the triangle, we should hear it going up and down linearly. And then the pulse, we'll hear it change mostly one and then change to another for a brief moment. And if we go back to the sawtooth where we started, so we're hearing the sine wave go up and down. The, uh, the thing that happens with frequency modulation is when you increase the speed of the, the control frequency, you get strange effects and uh, see if Alicia can dial in a, a funny sound with these two, uh, by changing these two knobs. So if we can get something that sounds like a funny spaceship or a funny sound of some sort. So when you, when you settle on a sound, let's leave it making a, a consistent sound. Now, if you just listen to this sound forever, it would be quite annoying. But the uh, the envelope object is the thing that we'll demo last year. When you press the envelope button, this will turn off the mixer and uh, and use the envelope instead of uh, 
and we can hear what the envelope does is it tries to emulate the intensity profile of a musical instrument. When you, uh, for example, blow into a flute, the uh, moment you blow into the flute, there's an increase in pressure and there's a louder sound for the very first moment. And the envelope changes the intensity of the sound over time. So it has an attack phase, which is similar to you're building up the pressure in a tube or you've struck an instrument and the, the sound waves are increasing. Then there's a decay phase where the initial excitation, the blowing into the tube is now, the pressure is equalizing and decreasing. The sustain phase is like you're continuing to continue to blow into the tube of flute. And then the release phase, after she lets up the button, is like a musical instrument decreases over time. If you've stopped making the note, there's still pressure in the air or there's still resonance in the, in the string. So the, uh, the envelope is meant to transform these really quite annoying sounds <laughs> into something that is like a musical note. So that's, uh, this just barely scratches the surface of, of oscillator synthesis. There are all kinds of, of ways to use these things but uh, at least we can see the basics here. Congratulations, you've made it all the way to part three. We're now gonna be talking about peak detection. So peak is the simplest analysis object that we have, but up till now we've only shown you how to build systems that control the audio. Now we're moving into systems that actually analyze and interact with that audio data. So we need to put two peak channels onto our canvas because we have stereo audio, so one for each channel. Once again, you can't run two outputs into one input. Now, another important thing to note is even if you just wanted to analyze this data, you need to have an input object or an output object for your, sketch to, for your code to function in this design tool. Uh, the, the SD player doesn't count, and Paul's made this a little easier for us by creating categories that are labeled input and output on your, on your left side there, so any of those objects will count, but the SD player is not one of them. So we're going to upload this, and we should start hearing our music again. And now if we open our serial monitor, we should see an ASCII graphic that's showing us our peaks, as well as a numerical read. Now if we slide the window of our Arduino program over this, so that we're hiding all but the last line, you kind of get an idea of what this might look like if it was being used for a line of LEDs in a project. There's a lot of things you can do with, with this peak detection analysis object in creating interactive costuming or, or DJ stage, light, stage lights, all kinds of projects. So if we scroll down in our code to find our peak function, you'll see some familiar functions available and read. So traditionally, these are about receiving data and they're designed to prevent data loss. Read gives the oldest data first and they don't wanna lose anything. In the audio library, you use them the same way, but they're designed to give you only the most recent data. And they intentionally discard old info. Audio is more concerned with real-time information. So the way each analysis object discards data is different, so you're going to want to check the documentation. In the case of peak, each read is only receiving the largest peak since the last read. All the smaller peaks are being discarded. So previously, we were printing every 40 milliseconds, and you can see that variable above our highlighted section. Let's turn that down to 10 and try printing every 10 milliseconds. Now, msex is a special variable because it is automatically increasing on its own a thousand times per second, so it makes it really easy to time how often we do a thing. So you can see how much faster that's scrolling than last time. Four times as fast. <laughs> So let's try going even faster. Let's see if we can bring it down to zero. Now this means every time it reads, it's going to print. So 
So you can see that's just flying. In this section, we're going to look at Fourier transform. The Fourier transform is totally awesome for audio projects that need to respond uniquely to different types of sounds. What it does is it gives you an analysis of how much of each frequency or tone is present in your sound as it plays. It's called FFT because uh, the FFT is a fast optimization for the Fourier transform. But even though it's even though it's fast, it puts quite a load on Teensy to do a 1024 point Fourier transform. So we're going to connect both of the inputs of this stereo uh, wave player to the mixer so that we can mix it down to mono and only need one FFT object. When we uh, put the code into the Arduino and upload, we should hear this sketch automatically play music. And if we bring the Fourier transform window, the serial monitor, you can see that the Fourier transform is producing a tremendous amount of data very, very quickly. So what does this data actually mean? These, uh, these columns are what are called the bins. The first bin is the amount of unchanging data or the DC signal, which normally would be very, very low in audio. The first bin, the bins are 43 hertz apart. So the first bin beyond DC is the amount of audio at 43 hertz, then 86 hertz, then 129 hertz, so on and so forth. You can see that there's a whole lot of bins. This is actually only printing the first 30 out of 512 bins. So there's a tremendous amount of data not even printing on the screen. However, those are very high frequencies that, that are only a small portion, only a couple the last few octaves of the audio band. So when you look at these numbers, let's, uh, let's turn off the auto scroll so we can see them standing still. These numbers are all very small. You can see that they're, they're you know, numbers that are all less than one. Uh, the reason why is, remember from our uh, discussion of mixers early on, the signals in the audio library are always uh, an amplitude of maximum of 1.0. So if the signal at any particular point is 1.0, all of the bins at that time have to add up to whatever the signal is. If the signal happens to be less than 1.0, suppose the signal is only 0.6, all of the bins that compose that signal add up to whatever the signal is. That's why we see fairly small numbers here. In a moment, we'll take a look at what these numbers mean. So if we turn the auto scroll back on, and if I press the middle button here, we'll hear a guitar sound. Now, if we scroll back up in the data, we can find some of the places where notes began. There's a good one right there. So you can see what happens here in these notes is when the finger plucks the string of the guitar, we see a lot of chaos. The string is resonating at all kinds of different frequencies, but then pretty quickly, the string begins resonating at, at a fundamental and some harmonics. And as time goes on, not very much time, the string settles towards whatever the desired note is. It resonates at a frequency that's primarily determined by where the player has his finger and the end of the guitar. That's the note that actually plays. And you can see this happening. And this is the type of thing that a Fourier transform can do for us, is we can see in this frequency data what actually occurred in real time as, the, as that note played. So if we scroll down in the Fourier transform example code, Near the bottom is this print number function. When we saw the music playing earlier, there was a massive jumble of numbers. And if we change this to 0 0.24, 024, we can decrease the amount or raise the threshold and decrease the amount of data that prints. Now, if we bring the serial monitor to the front after, uh, after it uploads. So as this music plays, we'll see that there's a lot less data being printed because we're, you know, we've raised our threshold. And uh, as we see this woman sing, see there, we can see her voice appearing. Sometimes when she sings, we'll see three or four columns as her voice has different tonal qualities. We should see a guitar appear in about the middle. There's the guitar appearing in about the middle of the screen. So when you work with the Fourier transform data, if you're going to use 
these numbers to control LEDs or motors or servos, uh, if you're going to use this data to make things happen, a big part of the, the process involves coming up with thresholds or looking for patterns within the data to decide when to do things. There's a kind of an art form to it. that You get a tremendous amount of data from the Fourier transform. And, uh, and just little things like this, like playing with the thresholds, can really make patterns apparent uh, just with the scrolling data. And there's all kinds of ways that you can try to analyze this. So now let's take a quick look at some of the limitations of a Fourier transform. These have nothing to do with Teensy and the Teensy Audio Library. These are just realities of how the Fourier transform works. Uh, if we push this right hand button here, we can get a tone. We get a pure tone that's 220 hertz. But when you look at the screen, we see that we have numbers in five of the bins instead of just one or two. And this is a, this is a thing that happens with Fourier transform because this, uh, this object in the Teensy Audio Library is using what's called a window function. It's using a Hanning window. And the, the windows prevent a problem called spectral leakage. So before we, uh, before we look at that, before we look at uh, what the Hanning window does, let's see what happens if we turn off the window. So let's go back over to the Arduino code and scroll down to the setup function. And we can configure which type of window the Fourier transform object uses. And if we set it to null and then upload this sketch, I believe it'll play music when it starts up, but we can just play the same tone right away. So now we'll see what now we'll see the Fourier transform run with no window at all. And if we try playing the tone, look at that. This is the same tone we saw just a moment ago, and it looks really horrible. But if we take a look at the code, if we take a look at these numbers here, you can see that in this column here which is the one closest to the, uh, that's the bin for 215 hertz, almost all of the 220 hertz actually ended up in this correct bin. But if you look all over in here, we see tons of what's called spectral leakage. That is what the Hanning window seeks to solve. The problem is, is that you can't have your cake and eat it too. The way the Fourier transform works is if your frequency is not exactly perfectly in one of the bins, you either get smearing from a window function but no spectral leakage, or you get spectral leakage, small amounts of data all over the audio spectrum when you wanted it just in one little area. Normally the window function is used, of course you can do either. So to understand where spectral leakage comes from, you need to consider the waveform that wasn't an exact multiple of the bins. When, when we put the 220 hertz waveform into the Fourier transform, this is what we gave it. This green rectangle is the portion of the waveform that the Fourier transform analyzed. But the Fourier transform gives us the spectrum as if the data it analyzed repeated over and over again. So if we take that green chunk and repeat it, this waveform here is the waveform that this Fourier transform actually analyzed. You can see it's mostly like a sine wave, but it has a bunch of parts on it that aren't anything like a sine wave. These little spiky parts, these little parts where two lobes occur too quickly, these are the spectral leakage. This is why we got data that wasn't like what we wanted. The solution, of course, to this is called a window function. What the window function does is you multiply the input waveform by basically a sine wave. There are a variety of these different windows. But what the windows do is they make the waveform zero at the ends where it would have joined together to the next Fourier transform and they make it one, you know, they pass the waveform in the center, so they make it sensitive only in the center of the time analysis. When you do this, you're not analyzing the original waveform anymore. What you're analyzing is something that looks like this. You have waveforms that are sinusoidal in the middle, or whatever you wanted, and they are zero at the ends. So what the Teensy Audio Library does, because this is only sensitive in the middle, is it does twice as many Fourier transforms. It applies the window shifted 50%, and it performs two times as many Fourier transforms. So you're getting the analysis. So each Fourier transform is primarily sensitive in the center of its window. And then you're getting overlapping windows. So, every, so even though we're at 44 kilohertz sample rate and we're analyzing 1,000 points, we get new data every 512 samples, or approximately 86 times per second, rather than 43 times per second. So when you get 
an available, when you get FFT.available in your code, you are getting the result of an analysis, which is 1,000 points, primarily sensitive in the, cen in the center of those 1,000 points, and you get a new one every 512 points, or 86 times per second. Uh, despite all of these issues with the Fourier transform that you either have window functions or spectral leakage, it's still totally awesome for audio projects. It's great for, for responding to sounds, but you do have to consider that the Fourier transform does have some of these limitations. Nothing to do with Teensy. These are just simply the mathematics of Fourier transform. Still great to use. So for this last section, we're just going to be adding this display and we're going to be running another peak analysis function. So I'm just going to get these wires hooked up. In the uh, workshop, we have the ground wires and the, the power wires already attached. So if you're doing this at home, you'll have to install your own wires there. So while Alicia hooks the wires up, I'm going to just draw our peak system again in the design tool. hard to see where I'm putting these wires with the audio shield in the way, but in the documentation you'll have the information about where they go. Right, and these connections are also documented on the PGRC website where this display is sold. Okay, so now I can attach my display. And I'm going to plug my Teensy back in to my USB cable. And you can see power is going to the board, and now we're going to upload our sketch. See how fast that, that display is refreshing, giving you that real time audio. Looks pretty awesome.